Welcome back. I'm Stephen. In the previous lesson, I introduced the beginning of psychology, which is structuralism. Its main idea is to dissect the human mind into different structures, with a rigorous, physical science approach. However, it's essential to understand that psychology is not just about cold data and variables, it also needs to address the vibrant aspects of life. This is where structuralism falls short, and functionalism emerges. So, when did the concept of functionalism arise? It appeared almost concurrently with structuralism, and its representative figure was an American named William James, often called the father of American psychology and a true master of the field. However, compared to structuralism, functionalism is not as well known today, and many professional psychologists may be unfamiliar with the name. Still, from the perspective of helping people, I believe it's a perspective you can't afford to miss. What are the main ideas of functionalism? I think you can understand it best by looking at the three most significant differences between functionalism and structuralism. People are adaptable. First, functionalism posits that the human psychological structure is unlocatable, constantly changing and flowing. Functionalists argue that the structuralist psychologists attempt to pin down different psychological structures in people is futile. William James said that trying to describe a person with fixed vocabulary is like grasping a snowflake in your hand and having only a drop of water left. What does this mean? It means that people do not have fixed psychological states, they are constantly changing. As I mentioned earlier, structuralism treats people as if they were computers and tries to explain their behavior by dissecting different psychological structures. However, people are not like computers. Computers are independent machines that don't care about you or deliberately malfunction because they like or dislike you. So, when a computer encounters a problem, it's easy to pinpoint it to the machine. But what about people? When you receive a call from your boss versus a telemarketer, your level of enthusiasm is likely to be different. Can you say that being enthusiastic or indifferent is an inherent psychological trait of yours? Definitely not. This is the perspective of functionalism, don't rush to label yourself, you are changing. The concept that people change is crucial. I believe it's common sense that everyone knows but often overlooks. I've encountered many parents who say, my child lacks concentration, what should I do? While at the same time, they say, he can play video games with complete concentration all day if no one bothers him. Isn't that absurd? They see that in a different context, their child's level of concentration varies, but they still worry that it's an inherent issue. In such cases, I would rephrase their words and say, When your child is repeating simple academic tasks, he can only maintain concentration for 10 minutes. But when he's playing games, he can stay focused all day, right? When you say it this way, these parents realize that their child doesn't have a concentration problem, he just has different interests in different tasks. So, when describing your psychological characteristics in the future, I suggest adding a word, temporarily. Instead of saying, I'm not good at socializing, say, I'm currently showing introverted behavior. It reminds us of two things, first, it's a choice, and second, it can change in the future. This is the most important insight from functionalism for me personally. Change serves a purpose. In addition to providing a new perspective on personal behavior, functionalism also creates new connections between individual behavior and the environment. As mentioned in the previous lesson, structuralism had an optimistic spirit akin to 19th century physical sciences. It believed that by breaking people down into different psychological structures, the essence of psychological phenomena could be found. However, their interest ended there. Functionalism, on the other hand, had an entirely different perspective, the external environment. It was deeply influenced by the theory of evolution, which emphasized that species were preserved by natural selection in their environment. Accordingly, functionalism also believed that a person not only changes but changes for a purpose, namely, to adapt to the environment. In a high-stress job, someone always loses their temper. A structuralist might say that this person has an irritable trait, while a functionalist might say that in a different job, they might not be as irritable. This insight can be seen as opening the door to a new world. Many seemingly inexplicable behaviors can be understood by placing them in a specific environment. For example, in a country with lax gun control. People are very sensitive to loud bangs, 
and a popping balloon at a gathering startles everyone. I know a foreign professor who came to China for a conference, took a walk in a park near the hotel, and heard a loud pop. He was so startled that he sat down on the ground, only to discover that it was an elderly man cracking a whip for exercise. We might find this story amusing, but to understand his reaction at that moment, we need to relate it to his original environment. It's not because he's timid, this was his way of survival in his native environment. Acceptance and the possibility of change, the third point I want to make is related to this, functionalism helps us to accept and change. As a psychological counselor, I can't help but insert a few words here. The aspect of functionalism that I appreciate the most is that it sees people as active, empowered individuals with unlimited potential. I've come across many psychology enthusiasts who, influenced by the structuralist thinking, spend a lot of time on self-analysis, identifying various traits. However, when it comes to the most fundamental question, do I want to change, and what do I want to become? They often avoid the topic. The result is that their learning of psychology not only fails to change themselves but also provides them with evidence to comfortably rationalize why they can't change. In such cases, the functionalist perspective offers a way out. Functionalism views individual behavior as a way to adapt to the environment, and this increases our acceptance of our behavior. It also provides the possibility of change. While increasing acceptance is easy to understand, the idea of change may initially seem illogical. Doesn't the environment determine behavior? How can a person change without changing the environment? For instance, the husband I mentioned earlier could claim, my upbringing has molded me into behaving this way, and even if I wanted to change, I can't. Functionalism does not view people as passive products of their environment, it emphasizes the flexibility of change. People can adapt to various complex environments because they tap into their potential and adapt as needed. If a functionalist were to have a conversation with the husband I mentioned, he might say, your wife needs you to change, and if you care about this marriage, you will find a way. Go for it. Some might say, but isn't this like pickup artist, PUA, tactics? They said they can't do it, so why force them? Note that functionalism and PUA are fundamentally different. PUA's logic is, you can't do it? No, you must do it, even if it causes you great suffering. This suppresses a person's subjectivity. Functionalism, on the other hand, emphasizes a person's subjectivity and says, you don't want to do it? You don't have to do it, but if you want to do it and find it challenging, challenges can be overcome. Functionalism empowers individuals to take control of their lives and recognizes their capacity to adapt and change. It is not about forcing someone to change against their will but rather encouraging them to explore the possibilities and work towards change if they desire it. Functionalism, despite not leaving a significant impact in the academic world, has inspired many people. This is why I strongly suggest that you understand some aspects of functionalist thinking. Let me introduce a psychologist named John Dewey, who is better known as an educator and has influenced many, including Hu Xiu and Tao Singji. If you're interested in child education, you might have heard of Dewey's name. He was also a functionalist psychologist. He advocated that children learn through social life and work, sparking their ability to solve problems autonomously rather than passively accepting textbook knowledge. The essence of these ideas is functionalism, encouraging children to adapt to their environment and problem-solve. Even today, this remains the dominant approach in innovative education. In summary, functionalism provides a different perspective from structuralism. Regarding self-identification, it acknowledges that human psychology is changeable. It also establishes connections between personal changes and the environment, suggesting that people change to adapt. The viewpoints of structuralism and functionalism do not need to be mutually exclusive, we can use both when observing a person. We can look at their stable, unchanging psychological traits while also considering their changing nature and growth in different environments. Finally, I'd like to leave you with a question to ponder. Which aspects of yourself do you think are better suited to be understood through the functionalist perspective? Will it help you accept the current situation, or will it provide a different perspective on change? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. The debate between structuralism and functionalism seems to foreshadow that psychology is a discipline filled with dialectics. Indeed, its further development has always been accompanied by various theories and methods. 
In the next two lessons, we will continue to discuss a group of significant controversies, psychoanalysis and behaviorism. In the next lesson, we will delve into the renowned field of psychoanalysis.